The first one is mTOR, which stands for mammalian target of rapamycin, the drug rapamycin. This is a protein complex in the cell that registers amino acids. When you have a lot of protein, you eat a big steak, it's going to activate this mTOR protein complex that allows the cell, causes the cell to build things. It's one of the reasons eating steak allows you to build more muscle, but that's not a recipe for longevity. What we know from many animal studies, even in yeast, if you downregulate the activity of this mTOR protein complex, you get longer life. Why? Because it's activating a process called autophagy, which recycles proteins. So when you're hungry, this autophagy will get all the old proteins, put them in the recycling bin, um, and then bring them out as fresh proteins. And that seems to be really important for longevity. In fact, even if you just inhibit mTOR and stimulate autophagy, that's sufficient to extend the lifespan of flies and even mice by dramatic amounts, even 30%. Right. And in this case, you, when you're hungry, AMPK will go up. AMPK, if you're wondering, it stands for AMP activated kinase. And that's just an enzyme that responds to low energy. So when you're hungry, you'll make more of it. And one of the main things that it does is it makes more mitochondria. We lose mitochondria as we get older. And when we exercise, we get more. And this is a way of artificially stimulating that production. Why do we need more mitochondria? Well, they're important for metabolizing things that you eat. But one of the main things that they are used for is to make energy, chemical energy. So when you activate AMPK, you'll feel better, you'll have more energy, and you'll also fight aging. Yeah, yeah but there's enough known about both mTOR and AMPK to make pretty strong conclusions that these are beneficial to human health as well. So the point is, we're going to give people the information right. in this podcast and in the notes, we're going to provide references, they can read more, to make informed decisions about whether they're going to try certain diets, lifestyles, and even medicines and supplements. We are. It's a fascinating time because we've got two worlds, um, and I, I walk in both worlds. One is there's clinical studies being done some of which I'm involved in with NAD boosters at Harvard. We've been testing two years of those in humans, placebo control, double blind trial. But because people can read the literature and, and hear about things, there's this self-experimentation world as well. Uh, a lot of it on the West Coast of the USA. And, and you hear stuff and these are anecdotal, but they also are interesting anecdotes that guide the, the clinical trials. Uh, and it's this very interesting time where we're in where there are parts of the population, let's call it 1% of the US, that is not waiting for the proof that this works. But I, I do want to say before we, we move on that there is pretty good evidence that modulating these defenses in the body in humans also works and should extend longevity. We're not just blind and, can't, you know, I'm not crazy experimenting on myself and my father. What we know actually is that drugs that inhibit mTOR, rapamycin, in low dose, intermittent, does mimic fasting and does boost immunity and does give biochemical changes that mimic fasting and predict longevity. And there are people that are taking rapamycin Again, we'll talk about that in episode five. But there's also metformin, which is a diabetes drug, and that activates AMPK. And that's also by looking at tens of thousands of people who take metformin for type 2 diabetes, been shown to slow down the occurrence, not just of diabetes, but other diseases of aging. Together, just those facts that I've told you make me convinced that fasting and the drugs that mimic fasting are going to be important for long-term health, but also wellness in, in your body today. Right. Well, let's name some of them. The, the Jains, the Jains in India. In India. They're, they're probably the, the, the most well-studied group. And that there's scientific evidence that they have the most number of people over 70 in good health than any other religion. Than any other group in, in, in India. India. Yeah. And we'll get to the vegetarian diet and what the science says about that versus a meat-based diet. But there are other religions of Christians fast. Uh, there's Ramadan uh, for Muslims. These are, these are not just coincidences. These aren't just religious practices. It's clear that humanity has figured out that you, get, you feel better, you look better, you ultimately are disease resistant. You may, might even help cure diseases by going through these periods of being hungry or at least not having food in your tummy. Why? Because it activates these three longevity defenses that we just mentioned. There are dozens of studies showing that fast periods of fasting are ben, is beneficial to people who are obese, uh, not just because they lose weight, but they turn on their body's defenses. They become more insulin sensitive and their glucose levels come down. Also showing that people of regular weight, like me, can benefit from, from fasting. There's a number of studies there. Uh, and these are all in the show notes if somebody wants to go and check them out. Um, but what's really interesting is that, that certain diseases, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, even cancer, those diseases seem to also benefit from fasting, including when you combine chemotherapy with fasting. You get this double benefit for many types of cancers. And then the final point that I think is really interesting is you can mimic fasting say metformin, a number of doctors prescribe metformin to patients with prostate cancer 
because it, more studies are showing that these mimicries, these molecules that mimic fasting or fasting or combinations of both will help you. Yeah, well, most specifically, those three defense mm-hmm. components in the cell, they take care of the body, not just for aging, but to fight diseases. In young people, middle-aged, genetic diseases, um, even something you might not think of, like macular degeneration has been shown to be slowed down and even reversed by fasting. Right. And we talked about them in our book, so th- that's also a resource. Uh, I get questions every day from people, how should I fast? And my first answer is, well, you're an individual, you've got a different lifestyle, different tolerance for for pain and hunger. Uh, You're a female or a male, you've got different microbiome. Um, These are really important things to take into consideration. When we recommend things, what we're saying is, you can try this. If it doesn't work for you, try something else. But also just to talk about our, one of our sponsors, Inside Tracker. I use Inside Tracker because it's not just, oh, I feel better today. We actually have to measure things, get a dashboard on your body to know if the, the, what you're doing, whether it's exercise or in this case, your diet and when you eat is working for you. Um, and that's why I've been able to optimize my diet over the last 20, if, in fact, 30 years. I'm not just guessing, I'm actually measuring, measuring it. it. Well, yeah. you wouldn't drive a car without a dashboard. So why do we do that for our bodies, which are even more important? Yeah. This is why I have autopilot. I, I drive a little crazy. Um, I do that with my body as well. It's all an experiment. But let, let's go through the diets. Okay, so that the, fa- the there's a fasting mimicking diet. Um, Volta Longo, a colleague of mine uh, from UCLA, uh, is a proponent of that. That's is a, a diet that low is mTOR activity. It's low in these branched chain amino acids that I've mentioned. Like yeah, that. you want them to the body to be in a state of perceived adversity. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, I'm running out of food. I'm not eating meat anymore because plants have less of these amino acids. So it, it, it responds to that low amino acid input. Volt has done some great work. Over the last few years, he and his group have shown that on this fasting mimicking diet, which they can send to your home, uh, that actually helps cancer patients survive and get get over chemotherapy quicker. Again, more evidence that fasting is good, not just for longevity, but for diseases. So that's one. The next one let's talk about, which a lot of people call intermittent fasting. We'll mm-hmm. just call it fasting. Um, this is a period if you go longer than a day, some people do three days, some people go for a week. Um, I wouldn't go longer than that because then you'll start chewing up your muscle, which you don't want to do. But these long extended periods are doing a real deep cleanse on the body and turning on that autophagy, that process of recycling proteins very deeply, especially once you get beyond the three day mark when your metabolism switches into what's called chaperone mediated autophagy, the deep cleanse. So that's fasting. And then there's time restricted feeding, which is what I do because I'm not very good at going beyond 24 hours. Yeah, well, time restricted feeding, which is what what I do, which is try not to eat till dinner. That's hard enough. I'm, I, my hat's off to people like Peter Atia. Uh, the doctor and podcaster who many of our audience will have heard of, uh, he can go for a week and he's he's got a lot of willpower. If you've ever met the guy, he's different than me. But let, let's get back to the, this um, time-restricted feeding. Uh, you want to have at least 16 hours of not eating or not eating very much. And then you can have eight hours. So typically that means having a late lunch if you skip breakfast or if you prefer to skip dinner. Uh, skip right. that. So when people say I'm skipping lunch, that's not as helpful. Uh, and so what I, I've done in my life, let's just use me as, a, as, as, as an example of an average human being because I'm, I'm pretty lazy and um, I'm not that driven. Uh, I prefer to take a pill, which is not the right thing. The, what I started out in my life was not to eat breakfast. And that pretty, I've pretty much been doing that since I was a teenager. Um, and that for me works because I'm not really hungry in the morning. I have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and I still do that. A little bit of yogurt to mix my supplements with to dissolve them. But that, and that's burnt off in 15 minutes. That's not going to be a big deal for the rest of the day. And I try not to eat at all until dinner. And then I have a really enjoyable, large-ish dinner. But it's certain type of food. We'll talk about the types of food later. But that gives my body this long window, uh, more than 20 hours of not having glucose circulating from the external world. Now, what happens when you do that, and it takes a few weeks for your body to adapt, is that your liver will learn how to compensate for lack of food. It's called gluconeogenesis, the generation of glucose from your liver. And it actually overcomes the feeling of hunger. When you first 
skip breakfast and lunch, you're going to be hungry. You're going to be nervous. You're going to say, I can't do this. Sinclair is an idiot. Well, this, is, this is why people fail at this is because they, they run into that and they think, this is how life is going to be for the rest of the time that I'm on this diet. I can't do this diet. Right. But do it for at least two weeks because after the two week, especially by the three week mark, your liver has now learned that you're not going to have breakfast or lunch and it will start making glucose at a steady level. That's really important because the, it's known that if you have these spikes of glucose, it leads to hunger when it crashes after a big meal. Um, but also that when you get hungry, you eat. So you're in this wave of hunger, eating, wave of, well, I, I would skip one meal and then go for two. Yeah. You can't do the whole thing. You, most people will fail. Uh, but you're trying to avoid this, this thing I was just talking about called reactive hypoglycemia, is that if you eat a piece of toast for breakfast or, or heaven forbid, a, a giant glass of orange juice, you'll have this spike in sugar and you'll feel great but then you, your body will put out too much insulin and suck that glucose out of your bloodstream and put you into a glucose deficit. And that's hypoglycemia. And then you're hungry. You've got ghrelin coming out into your body and you, you feel hungry and you need to eat something. I'm at a state though now where I don't get those rises and crashes. My liver is putting out glucose from when I wake up till dinner. And I've never been so focused. I've never been so um, brain fog free. Because the, these crashes, what they do is they make you feel shaky or tired and brain fog. And I wish I'd done this in my 20s and done it my whole life because I've really never felt better because of it. Can we uh,